So this talk uh, is a uh, uh, one thing I would have added to Benno's keynote in the, uh, this morning is the reason I like to work with BSDs is uh, I feel like there's a good bit more of a deliberative process to uh, how we develop and move forward. Uh, this talk is very much in that spirit. So a good chunk of this I consider basically a design review. So please chime in if you have comments or questions or anything. Uh, I will let you know when there's when we're in the more instructional parts. So which is the introduction is one of those. So, so I'll start with the motivating example uh, for uh, why I why one would want to do what I'm proposing. Um, so consider uh, signed kernel modules or signed kernels and or kernel modules. Uh, so we have L files that uh, carry a, a public key signature, and these are checked uh, by the bootloader and by the kernel. And that way, uh, you know if you load a, uh, a module that you're loading something that has been checked out and signed by the person who built it. This isn't somebody injecting something into your kernel. So uh, UEFI and Grub both have uh, some kind of facility for doing this. So this is an example of uh, cryptography functioning as a trust mechanism. Uh, most people, when you mention cryptography, think of it as, as a confidentiality or data uh, protection mechanism. But it can also be a trust mechanism. Um, in most operating systems, trust is sort of implicit with the kernel. Uh, so kernel enforces all protections, and we trust the kernel because it's the authority. Uh, this is actually what I would call, what I call in other work I'm doing, uh, authoritarian security. Uh, the other extreme of that would be uh, innate security, which is cryptography, where you're trusting an algorithm. Uh, what I'm proposing is somewhere in the middle, where we're using public key cryptography to enhance uh, an operating system's uh, in, uh, built in trust mechanisms. So, examples here we have signed kernels and modules, possibly executables and libraries. Uh, we can do trust delegation, uh, so public key cryptography would let us, say, do things like issue uh, uh, a capability on one system and have it honored on, on another. Um, we can do sort of more far-reaching things like uh, cryptographic level access controls uh, and, of course, traditional public key trust management. So in public key cryptography, trust is an integral part of, of uh, the entire system. So we usually have some set of public keys that we trust implicitly. So these are the root keys. Uh, these are considered the roots of trust. And we, we extend uh, that trust to other, other keys through, uh, by signing those keys. So this uses public key signatures. Uh, public key, and, and we, can, we can form chains of trust all the way back to the root keys this way. So public key infrastructure, which is uh, certs, um, is based on this, uses a tree-like mechanism. Uh, PGP uses a web of trust, so a graph mechanism. All right, now we're moving into the design overview. So this is me actually describing uh, the uh, infrastructure I propose to build. Uh, so feel free to chime in. So the infrastructure consists of two major components. That's the runtime trust database and the uh, trust base configuration. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, the primary interface to the runtime uh, trust database is, a, I'm proposing, is a DevFS, uh, so a device file system interface. So basically, you're talking through device nodes. And I'll get into more of the details about how that works. Uh, there's also some uh, auxiliary systems like uh, ELF, signing, uh, ELF signing conventions. And this system inter uh, addresses mo many of the same problems that the NetBSD very exact uh, infrastructure addresses, and I think we can achieve a good bit of a, of a interaction, a beneficial interaction between these two systems. So first, the in kernel API. So this is basically a public key, a, a PKA style trust database. Uh, I'm proposing we have a set of root certificates. These are established at boot time. These do not change through the course of a running system uh, without hardware intervention. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, that establishes a higher level of, of uh, integrity for these keys. Uh, so the trust database is uh, structured like a forest. Uh, the roots, of course, are the, uh, are the root keys. 
Um, you can add an intermediate key provided it is signed by an existing intermediate key or a root key. Uh, all keys have a revocation list. If you add a revocation list and an, it contains currently existing intermediate keys, those keys and all their descendants are revoked. So basically every key is in, in the database is guaranteed to have a chain of trust back to a root. Um, and the basic functionality, we can check a signature against this database and we can uh, enumerate the database. <clears throat> so the uh, device file system interface, and I think this is, uh, I, I can uh, go into more detail as to why I think this is the correct way to interface with this sort of a system. Uh, propose you have dev trust as sort of the, the we can change the path if, if people don't like it. Uh, but dev trust is, is basically the root of these device nodes. Uh, trust CTL is a node to which you can write an X509 certificate or uh, revocation list. And at that point, it's processed and uh, either rejected or accepted and, and integrated in, into the kernel's trust database. Uh, the, the format that I propose for this is the uh, binary uh, DER as uh, distinguished encoding rules. And I'll get into more details as to why, why that format uh, in a bit. You can enumerate the certificates through uh, trust. Sorry? Uh, is that meant to be a manageable file system? So that, that would be uh, DevFS device nodes. Okay. So the driver would, would create these device nodes. And that, that's the primary means by which you talk to the system. Okay, so it's a yeah. file system. Right. Um, well, it's, it's a device file. It's, it's nodes in the device file system. Yes? Uh, I, I talk about that in, in a couple of slides. Um, that, that's, that's sort of what Linux does. Uh, there's advantages, and n n having this interface doesn't stop you from doing that, but there's advantages to this style of interface. Um, so you can enumerate the certificates or just the root certificates uh, at these two nodes. Uh, I propose you read back certificates in the uh, PIM encoding, and there's, a, there's reasons for that I'll get into. Yes? Okay. Uh, there's caveats to open PGP, but uh, but uh, I, this this doesn't need to be the only the one and only way to get uh, keys into the system. No, Okay, um, right. So as for uh, more detail on setting up root keys, uh, so there's three different uh, techniques you could use. Uh, they all have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, one is you can build them directly into the loader in the kernel. Now for loader, that's necessary, um, unless you're pulling keys out of, a, out of a hardware device, like an EFI uh, uh, platform key or something. Uh, advantage there is that uh, a, a, an attacker can't, uh, you know, somehow get a, get their own key into the system because the keys are all built in. Uh, another advantage is you get a, you get the full cipher suite. Uh, disadvantage is it's inflexible. Uh, another option is you obtain the uh, uh, the keys from something like a TPM. Uh, advantage there is that you're you're interfacing with the hardware. The disadvantage is that. Uh, TPM crypto suites tend to be uh, are, are, are rather disappointing. Uh, sort of RSA uh, 2048 is the best public key you're going to get. Um, another option is you pass from a loader uh, to the, this is, is an incomplete option, but you can pass from the loader to the kernel via the key buff mechanism. Uh, key buff is a, uh, a, an interface I added to help support Geli. It is specifically designed to be extensible so we can add more, to, uh, more kinds of keys. Uh, it's as without any code mod. No, you'd have to add a, a, a magic number. But as it's designed now, it could support up to RSA 4096. Uh, um, so that third option is probably the best for standard builds because it, it, you know, people can use their kernel. They don't have to modify it, but they can use their own platform keys. 
Uh, root key is the is the uh, root of trust for this trust system. It's whatever key you you establish as the root of trust for your system. So I'm I'm going to get into that here. So the trust base configure so the runtime trust configuration is a system a running system. Uh, trust base configuration is how you configure the build system to produce whatever root key sets you want. So uh, proposing here, you have uh, files under Etsy that store the root certs and the intermediate certs. Um, uh, intermediate certs would be we'd add a uh, machinery to RC to load these at run to, uh, at boot time. So basically, it would go through and uh, scan all those certificates and load them into uh, through this DevFS interface. Uh, the root keys uh, to build to build the root keys in, you can uh, you can convert them to C source and then compile them into a static library, and then you'd have a dot a, a that you could use to build the uh, the root keys directly into anything you want. Uh, you don't have to use that, but that's that's how you achieve the the, the bake down option. Uh, so this is answering your question. So there's a lot. Uh, this is a, a flexible uh, framework, and there's a lot of ways you could set up root key sets. Uh, here's a couple of options. Uh, the, what I propose is the preferred configuration: is you have every machine has its own. Um, uh, root key. There's one of these, so there's only one root key on a system. Uh, that sort of represents the user's control over their own system. Uh, it's also in line with uh, IBM's uh, trusted boot uh, framework for uh, power. Uh, everything else is a uh, an, inter an intermediate key that's signed by this root key. So anybody you choose to trust, you can revoke that trust. Um, now standard distributions. So say what the FreeBSD uh, project would put out as a standard build, you would have a, uh, a certificate for the FreeBSD project, and that would be, the, that would be set up as a, as a trust root. Um, however, you could have the installer uh, generate these uh, platform keys and then sign the, uh, the FreeBSD project's certificate. And that way you achieve the preferred configuration but you also are trusting uh, builds directly from FreeBSD. And an alternate configuration for a high security network would be uh, I have a centralized uh, root key. I don't, I don't give the, uh, the private key out to every machine. I just give the public key. So that way, this would be like a, a, a high security network where I build everything on some central location and then distribute it out to a bunch of machines. And that way, uh, I can't. Uh, I can't load modules or, or possibly run executables that aren't signed by this by the the network uh, the central network, uh, but I still I still have access to this kind of a system. So, getting into formats, so this is uh, getting into the questions you asked. So, OpenSSL is part of FreeBSD base. This is why I, I uh, designed the system to work with OpenSSL. Uh, X509 certificates are a pretty standard format, so that's why I chose those. Uh, the, the binary dir encoding is very easy to parse. Uh, it every, it's essentially, every element tells you how long it is up front. So it's, it's very easy to write a parser and very easy to write one that doesn't accidentally have buffer overflows. Uh, because you have a distinguished encoding, you can do uh, mem copy uh, comparisons. So, you know. Particularly for um, for the names for these certificates, you can you can just directly mem copy them. You don't need to even uh, sub parse them out. The PIM encoding is the standard for most applications, so um, like uh, Apache or SlapD or whatever other network services, those usually use PIM encoded certificates. So that's why I chose that for output. Uh, Right. Uh, sorry, your question's a little later along. So as far as signed executables go, uh, the ELF file format has, is already based on sections. It already has facilities for adding metadata to files. So I, I actually have code written to, uh, to create these. So the format is you basically add a .sign section uh, that contains a, a CMS message, a CMS detached signature. 
and you compute this by zeroing out the sign section, uh, CMS detached signatures have, have a, a constant size for a given cipher. So you, you, uh, you zero out that section, uh, compute the signature, and then drop the signature into that slot. And you can actually do this without even the tool, without even writing your program to do it. You can do this with uh, some magic with OpenSSL and uh, ObjCopy, which is uh, quite nice. And you can verify you can verify these two. So now on on the alternatives. So Grub uses detached uh, GPG signatures in a separate file. So you'd have like kernel and then kernel.sig. Um, that has some administrative consequences. Uh, you have to modify all your, um, all your installers and everything else to you know, have these .sig files everywhere. Uh, Linux has a, uh, has a, a keyring uh, system with a system call interface. Uh, the big reason that I chose uh, DevFS is that it can interact. You can use a lot of applications without having to modify them. Uh, the Linux approach, you have to go and mod first you have to have special control programs to actually talk to the uh, uh, the in kernel key ring. And second, you'd have to modify all your existing applications to use this. With the DevFS, you don't have to modify anything. Uh, so as far as, this, like I said, signed, uh, signed elf, I went with that because uh, the, the signatures are contained inside the files. They're not separate, uh, so there's no administrative consequences. Uh, also, the, uh, the PGP Web of Trust system is arguably the wrong trust model. Uh, this is a top-down routes, uh, uh, routes to intermediates to leaves uh, trust model, and the Web of Trust really doesn't apply here. And also, uh, PGP, the, uh, the sign, no, the key owner, uh, not the signatories, revokes the signatures. So when you say applications don't have to be modified, <clears throat> Applications don't currently assume that they can open slash dev slash trust slash something and get some information out of it. So, you know, modification is required anyway, right? Well, are you saying that this is meant to be a drop-in replacement for your like dot whatever key ring file? So Apache, uh, for yeah, yeah, that. So uh, say Apache or or most other uh, sort of web SSL and, and enabled web services. Uh, at some point in their configs, there's a uh, CA file. And you point that at some file that has all your, your trusted keys. You could point that at slash dev slash trust slash root certs, and that would just work. Um, unless they're doing, uh, unless they're somehow detecting, oh, this is a device, let me not open it. Uh, but I don't think, I don't think most do. Uh, so if, if they're capable of opening that device node and then parsing uh, standard pen, uh, concatenated PIM encoded certificates, then it would work. Uh, okay, um, I, I, I'm not I, I'm not going to die on the hill of path names. Uh, if if you prefer slash proc, then sure. Um, yeah, we can change the path names. Okay. So I'd like to make an argument uh, in favor of a distributed model instead of a top-down model. Um, there's a lot of work being done on reproducible builds, and the idea behind this is, okay, I... This is a web of trust, not as opposed to a, 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 a forest, basically. Well, I, I don't want to like get accidentally pull in extra semantics by using okay. terms that people may understand differently. Um, so, in the model of I have a central place which builds my <coughs> my binaries for whatever. Um, okay. If I'd like to remove that machine from my trusted computing base, so that if that infrastructure is compromised, that I am no longer totally owned, what I would like to do is have all builds produce like if from these sources always produce but resulting binaries with identical hashes. So remove all non-determinism in your builds. Okay. And there's a lot of effort being done towards this. And so the, the result of this is I would build. Can we move this to the end? Sorry, I I I want to. Uh, 
get through it before we <coughs> deep dive. No problem. Sure. Uh, so, uh, NetBSD, uh, this actually probably uh, ties in though to what you're talking about. So, uh, NetBSD very exec. Um, uh, net, that's uh, NetBSD very exec is based on Max, so that's uh, symmetric key uh, message authentication codes, and you create a registry and you load this in, and it's a key by path, and then when you go to load those executables or kernel modules or whatever, uh, you check the Mac. Um, advantage here is that it's out of band, so I'm not even putting signatures into the ELF files. Um, the uh, key disadvantage is that it's a symmetric key, so it cannot delegate trust. Uh, because you have to know, you, the ability to check a signature implies the ability to create one, which is not the case with public keys. Um, so, a basic integration, yes? Sorry, the, 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 Mac, the Mac framework version of Verify is up in Cobra Beta. <coughs> Okay. Uh, including configuration files and so on. So you're, you're um, if, I, if I understand you correctly, you're already checking a public key signature. Yeah. Okay, so, th so that's, that's what I was about to suggest is, uh, in which case you just outsource that uh, public key check to uh, the trust framework. Well, uh, yeah, we embed it in the, the, the thing that parses the manifest that can be used to be internal. <clears throat> Okay. Basically, there's no need to put any crypto in the kernel at all. Okay. In in the integra in the integration I'm proposing, you would uh, you would use the uh, the trust framework to do the the, the public key signature check. Uh, there's also an additional uh, uh, possible improvement to very exec. So very exec uses is, is keyed by paths, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, sort of. So what you could do instead is watermark uh, ELFs with a UUID. Uh, you could generate that. It doesn't have to be a good hash. It, it is said to be a ha uh, re you know, relatively uh, collision-free. And SHA-1 in, in reality will work for that purpose. I wouldn't trust it as a cryptographic, but it will work for this purpose. Uh, so you're, just gener you're basically generating a watermark. And then you could check. Uh, instead of checking against a path, you check against the watermark. Um, yes? What happens if I swap bin true and bin false? Say again? What happens if I swap bin true and bin false? I have two binaries which are both valid to be executed, but I put them in different places. Yes, yeah, so I don't key the, uh, uh, do those by path. Um, you could use either mechanism. The, when, when the mechanism has been loaded, the path name is Okay, so moving on to, uh, uh, this is this bit's instructional, so um, uh, just let me get through it. Uh, post, uh, integrating post-quantum cryptography. Uh, so where we stand with regard to quantum, uh, crypt, uh, quantum computing and cryptography. Uh, I consider it a, 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 decent, uh, a, a decent rule of thumb that uh, at some point between uh, five years out and 50 years out, we're going to have uh, very likely to see quantum computers that can attack uh, public key cryptography, uh, existing public key cryptography schemes. So the, the, the really bad one here is the hidden subgroup attack. This breaks RSA, it breaks all, uh, all, known, all, all existing elliptic curves, um, uh, discrete log. So basically, all currently widely deployed public key cryptography. Uh, there's a theoretical attack uh, called Grover iteration, but it's really a theoretical attack. Uh, the takeaway is that uh, symmetric key hashes and max are, 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 are safe. Uh, public key is broken. So a reaction to this is what's called uh, post-quantum cryptography. This is distinct from quantum cryptography in that uh, post-quantum is entirely based on classical computing and classical communication. So you don't need a uh, uh, high-integrity lasers and high-quality fiber and 
a direct link to whoever you're talking to. You can just send us, uh, you can do this with your existing hardware. So there are viable key exchange mechanisms being deployed. Uh, the signature story isn't quite as nice. Uh, there are existing viable uh, uh, ciphers, but they, all, they have caveats. So one, uh, these are, by, by the way, I believe both have draft standards out on them. Uh, one is XM, XMSS. This is a uh, stateful uh, hash-based signature scheme. Uh, so it's, it's a different interface from a typical public key signature scheme. There's a state object that's updated with every signature. And if you ever reuse a state object, uh, that break, you've lost the security properties of, of, of the signature scheme. Uh, so uh, Google's Adam Langley called this a giant foot cannon. You can imagine sort of nightmare scenarios where I have uh, virtual machine images and I accidentally, you know, reload a snapshot and accidentally resign something. Uh, a solution to this is a, a, a cipher called Sphinx. Uh, this is stateless, so we're back to the, the traditional uh, model, but the signatures are, are pretty big. Uh, they're 40 kilobytes in size. So how do we use, how can we use these in trust? Uh, first, uh, the stateful uh, signature schemes are actually really good for batch signing. So if, say, if I, if I, if I you know, do a build and I want to batch sign everything, that's not dangerous. I can use a stateful signature scheme there and, and, and not be afraid. Uh, with a little, uh, with a slightly more fear, uh, you know, I can have a kernel controlled stateful signature scheme that, uh, you know, there's sort of one way in, one way out, so I'm, I'm at far less risk of, of duplicating signatures. The only way I could do that is if I snapshot an entire machine and then reload it. Uh, uh, snapshot a running machine image. Uh, Sphinx is really good for signing big messages or, one or, or you know, one-time messages. So NetBSD, very exact manifests are probably a lot larger than 40 kilobytes. Not really. Okay. But you could, you know, you could concatenate them, and, and also you're only you're you're loading them once. So, if you load it once at boot time, then 40 kilobits, uh, 40 kilobyte signature is not te not terrible. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So on to now we're back to uh, uh, free comments. Uh, applications and, and implementation roadmaps. So uh, there's a number of potential applications to a system like this. Uh, obviously, the first is a signed kernel, uh, kernel and modules and trusted boot, uh, sort of the motivating case. Uh, signed executables and configuration files. Uh, so I could I could lock down an entire system this way. And uh, I think I'd, I'd like to see somebody look into uh, sort of remote delegated capabilities. So generate a, a, a token, a public key signature, and then you can pass that over a network, and then some other machine can say, OK, uh, this system has authorized this action. Uh, I, there's probably some interesting things you can do with that. Uh, as far as implementing all this, uh, the biggest barrier I see is that the kernel crypto uh, story is, is kind of a mess. Um, and we had a talk about, <laughs> there go the hands. <laughs> okay. So, uh, just one, one comment. To, sorry. So, I can see some value in having the kernel be able to contain that via trust store. Mm -hmm. um, the big question is, why do you need anything more than that? I mean, yes, there's value in putting my, if I, whatever trick is I decide I want to trust <coughs> into the kernel to hold safely so that I. When I was originally doing this crap with Verified Exec 15 plus years ago, um, coming up with a trust store that wasn't in some way scrutable was a very important thing. That's why we took the burning it into the binary approach. Having the kernel as a, a trusted store of that information, good. Um, but why do you need anything more than that in the kernel? Uh, so so why, the, uh, why the trust database? No, no. Trust database in the kernel is fine. Okay. So that I've got somewhere I can trust where to go and get it. Why do you need 
why do I need anything else in the kernel? Especially if I'm going to use verified exec, so that the kernel has, you know, he's got fingerprints for the binaries that he knows are trustworthy. He can verify the binaries he ends at. It's not limited to binaries. It can do it for anything. Why do I need any actual proof of the kernel? So you're. If I understand you correctly, uh, you're verifying, you're doing the signature check for very exec in user, in user space. Yeah, or in the case of the rubber that's in the rubber itself. Okay. Uh, then that, you could do that in the kernel, and that way you're not trusting an arbitrary user space program. Uh, that's true, but that's a fairly big overhead for a fairly minor game. Um, okay. Uh, it, it depends how much you might be able to Not all of it, but uh, the, pr uh, the low-level primitives, I think. Uh, if, and if we're already talking about uh, sort of unifying, I think we have, what, three different sort of crypto frameworks in the kernel. Um, if we're already talking about unifying those, then it might be better to, to pull in the low-level primitives from some, uh, from some library. Um, yes? So I have this kind of sneaking suspicion that you're actually trying to solve two different problems, okay. and that using one mechanism for both of them is going to lead to unintended consequences. So I mean, on the one hand, there is the prevent stuff that shouldn't run from running okay. problem, right? And then this, there's this separate thing that you're talking about, which is a drop-in replacement for CA files and stuff. But I don't see how these two are related. For example, I think you might be assuming that a call to open slash dev slash trust slash whatever, the data is definitely going to come from the kernel and that the application uh, can see that that CA certificate is somehow more trustworthy. But that's not actually true, right? I can set up LD preloads to, to wrap system calls and things so that the thing that you thought was coming from the kernel is not coming from the kernel, at which point, why isn't it just a file in the file system with conventional DAC or MAC permissions applied to it? Like, I, I get the point of trying to make sure the loader verifies the kernel before it loads it. The kernel verifies modules before it loads them. The kernel maybe does the very exact thing on binary. <coughs> I get that, but I don't see how that's connected to this arbitrary trust store stuff. Like, if there's application specific, uh, for example, I trust the FreeBSD project to provide me with a binary to run. I do not trust the FreeBSD project to interpose itself on all of my network communications. Right? So right. the fact that the FreeBSD project can sign stuff, well, they can sign a binary, that's fine. I don't want them to sign, uh, I don't want the project to be able to sign arbitrary certificates. So they're very different purposes, and conflating them can lead to bad outcomes. Um, OK. There's a couple of things there. Uh, so one, uh, right? Uh, one, uh, being able to intercept, being able to LD config and intercept uh, calls to open dev trust whatever uh, versus an arbitrary file system. It, it seems like that's not any. You can do that with an arbitrary file system file too. Right. At which point, why not just have files? Like, and then we don't have to put more crypto stuff in the kernel. Right? If all I want is a file that contains a set of CA certificates I trust, then I can just keep that in a file. And I don't need to do any extra work of putting more crypto stuff in the kernel. Um, as, for your, as for your basic question, uh, I've, oh, crap. Hang on a second. As for your basic question, uh, I view this as a trust management system. So. Uh, this is managing trust in the form of public key signatures and, and public keys that are trusted uh, to trusted sign to things. Do what, though? Because trust is not an absolute concept. Uh, so that can be done. Uh, X509 has extensions for uh, further subdividing uh, trust. Not implemented even in OpenSSL. So when we looked at doing a PKI a couple of years ago, we said, ooh, X509 <coughs> has attribute certificates, which means that you can provide limited signatures. I trust the bearer of this private key or the bearer of the private key corresponding to this certificate for the following purposes. But I mean, OpenSSL doesn't even implement that because the OpenSSL code base is, to a first approximation, unextensible. 
And so part of the reason we gave up on it is because we couldn't write tools that we could use to do this kind of stuff. Okay, but uh, public key trust can be subdivided. Um, the, the standards exist, and it is possible to implement them. So if you wanted uh, a more fine-grained notion of trust, then you could, you, you could build this. What you can't do with a user space solution is have the system itself understand what it means to trust something. Yes? It kind of sounds like what we need is a formalized white paper that presents risks and mitigation for those risks. Okay. Okay, uh, so I do. Th there is a, a, a paper version of this talk. Uh, it does not go deep into potential attacks. It's mainly describing uh, the, ar the architecture, but it could be extended and, and with that deliberation uh, taken on. Okay. Um, yeah, this, this is this is close to the end. So, uh, right the. Uh, the kernel crypto uh, situation is, I, I view, as the biggest barrier. Uh, figuring out where we're going with, with regards to uh, the kernel crypto framework needs to be done. Uh, beyond that, the tasks are not terribly difficult. And the uh, 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 sort of a, a batch ELF signer I've already implemented. Uh, so I already have code for the assigned ELF uh, format. Signing, signing ELF binaries um, is, is nice, but it, I, as far as I can tell, it's not nearly as efficient as you know, signing. Again, one of the reasons we did the verified exec versus signing binaries literally is the cost to verify them. Right. So with, with the verified exec, you can do a single signature verification for a manifest that might represent a thousand Signing works. I mean, they had it into RS a long time ago, but I'm not sure it's as efficient. So, uh, in, in my analysis, it, it seems to me more that uh, very exact and ELF signing are sort of complementary approaches. They're not competing. They both do things, uh, they both have advantages that the, that the other doesn't have. Uh, so, ELF signing, you can sort of easily uh, send a one off program. Uh, install a one-off binary, and and it, it's sort of more, it's more portable. Um, uh, very exec, of course, has all the advantages you mentioned. Uh, that's why I. The other thing we do with verified exec is we can associate um, <coughs> labels with a process, so you can find, you can use the same manifest to not only verify the application but associate right. labels with it. Yeah, that, that's why I work to try to find uh, ways to to have these uh, these two systems interact. Uh, right. Yeah. So the rest is is details about uh, about how to implement things. But I think we're more into a discussion at this point. So, any other questions? Yes. Uh. So. Um, in what I've described, oh, well, actually, if you're if you're doing a delegation, of uh, if you're doing the trust delegation, I I, I uh, proposed, then you do need private keys in the kernel, uh, because you have to generate signatures. Uh, the basic system I described doesn't need them, uh, so just just doing sign uh, kernel and module, or signing you know uh, very exact or trust management, all you need is public keys. If you wanted to generate signatures that somebody else checks, yes, you need private keys. 
uh, that, uh, as far as symmetric keys goes, that that I think is really a separate issue. Um, that that's sort of more into uh, hardware enclaves or trusted hard uh, trusted crypto hardware. Yeah. So as soon as you start dealing, starting to deal with private keys and so on, you, I, I don't know about anybody else, but as a as a vendor who has to sell stuff to the government, um, <laughs> we have to comply with all sorts of um, regulations. Um, one of which is you know private keys need to be destroyed when entering a country. We're not actually using them. So right. Um, right. So, yeah, if you want to go that route, I would recommend, first of all, an option to say, uh, turn off all features that require private keys in the kernel um, for, the, for exactly the reason you mentioned. And secondly, uh, you know, look at what your hardware options are. Uh, if you don't have the hardware, then, you know, that, that needs to be subject to very careful review. Uh, the option, an, an option I sort of uh, skipped over was with XMMS signatures, if you have a, sort of a session key pair that dies when the system goes down, uh, it's never <coughs> persisted. Um, that uh, as long as you don't snapshot a running machine's memory, uh, and, and as long as you kill that when the machine suspends or when it goes, when it, when it exits, uh, at that point you, ha you have a, a way of generating signatures that are only valid for the duration of a machine's uh, uptime, uh, and I think there's probably some interesting capabilities there. Did somebody else over here have a? Okay, so I think we're yeah we're 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 at the end of the talk at this point. So uh, thank you for coming.